Hi, I'm Gareth Green, and in this video, we're going to be having a look at quite a famous piece by Franz Schubert. It's one of his impromptus, and it is in fact the impromptu in A flat, D935. D is the cataloguing system that we often use for Schubert. So, you know, one of the things that we're going to be thinking about if we want to come up with an interpretation. So this is assuming, you know, you've got the notes learned and you're fairly happy about fingering and all that kind of stuff. But then what do we do with it? Because it's amazing how many people get as far as doing all that hard graft, learning notes, sorting out fingering, making sure the rhythm's happy. But then it's kind of like, well, how do I actually play the piece? So first of all, let's just get a flavor of this piece and you can see the score in front of you. So that's how it begins. There's the famous impromptu. Well, one thing we're going to be thinking about here is where is the melodic line? Now, you don't have to get very far into thinking about this score to realize that the melody is very much at the top of the texture. So what does that mean for pianists? Well, it means we've got to think about balancing the texture. We need to make that line sing out at the top. Now, one technical thing that easily gets in the way of this is that in the right hand, okay, you've got this tune, this lovely tune, Schubert was a great writer of melody because he was a great songwriter, so he knows how to write a beautiful melody. But in the right hand, you've also got to deal with playing these chords. And the trick here is to make sure that you don't get too much emphasis on those thumbs at the bottom of the right hand, because what we don't want is all these thumb notes bashing out because they'll easily get in the way simply because the thumbs drop on notes and then you've got your weaker fingers going on the melody at the top so fingers four and five if they're not kind of strong enough then we're not going to project that melody so before you know it you're thumping out those thumb notes and the poor old melody disappears altogether in the left hand, you might notice we've got a musical device going on for quite a long time. This note here, lots of E flats being repeated over and over again. Do you see here they are going on all the way through here, all the way to that point. So you've got many bars, many measures of that repeated E flat. So that's what we call a dominant pedal point. It's the fifth note of the scale in A flat. So it's there. And the dominant pedal point tends to be used to kind of either kind of very strongly or very gently build a little bit of tension that's waiting for a kind of resolution to its tonic. So in this piece, because it's marked you know, pianissimo at the beginning. We don't really want that dominant pedal point thumping out. We just want it to be there. And then we'll kind of feel its resolution when we get down to this cadence, when, when that dominant pedal point is resolved. But again, if you're not careful, that left hand is going to be busy with the thumb making those E flats too loud with the thumbs. So you've got a particular technical challenge in this piece. It's not the hardest piece of piano music ever written, but the technical challenge is kind of more subtle. How do you control those thumbs so we're not getting too much of those middle notes? And how do you work these slightly weaker fingers at the top so this melody sings out? So balancing your texture, very important thing to do. Now, later on, we're just going to sort of look at this first section on this page in this video. Later on, we've still got the melody at the top, but you may decide when you get down here that there's a slightly more equal impact of these chords. You know, all the chords working together. Well, there still, I think, is a case for a little emphasis at the top, but it's a slightly different kind of balancing up when you get there. So, it's at the beginning and at the end of this page where you've got to be particularly careful with this question of balance. Okay, here's another thing to think about. The time signature, three, four. Well, okay, so what does that mean? Three crotchet beats in, in every bar or three quarter note beats in every measure. Fine, okay, but what's the natural way to play that? 
Normally, when you're in triple time, you're trying to make for the first beats of the bar. So if it kind of plods with sort of equal emphasis on each beat, that's going to kind of kill the shape of the phrase. So if we feel three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, to, it's going to feel interminable and we're not going to feel that line singing to us. So what's the natural way to deal with triple time? One, two, three. One, two, three. So in other words, making that first beat a bit stronger than the second and the third beats. Now, this isn't really a kind of waltz, is it? But it's sharing something in common with a waltz by having that triple time meter. OK, so the opposite danger of what I've just demonstrated is that we then think, oh, great, so I've now got to go for the first beats of every bar. So then we overcook it and we do this. Well, that's not subtle at all, is it? It's not working. And we don't really feel where the second and the third beats sit on the back of that first beat. So there's a little bit of a clue to thinking this in triple time. How do we lean on the first beats, but enable the second and the third beats to sit on the back of that first beat and have a sense of lift at the end of the bar without clipping the last note? Because Here's the next danger, that you're sort of thinking, OK, I've got to, got to get a bit of an emphasis on the first beat. I've got to be a bit lighter on the third beat. So maybe I'll do this. OK, well, that's sort of delivering a bit of emphasis on the first beat. But here the third beats are kind of hiccuping at the end of every bar. So you don't want that to happen either. We've got to deliver a line. This melody is a very connected melody. And you notice there's some phrasing in there. But what have we got at the beginning? Sempre legato. Always smooth. So even though there is a sort of little uh, sort of hints of this phrasing here, we've got to be a little bit careful we're still preserving a legato line. So we're not going to kind of break it up by clipping the third beats. So we've got to have a feel for how are we delivering three beats in a bar, a little bit of emphasis on the first beat of the bar, a little bit lighter on the second and the third beats, the third taking us lightly onto the first beat of the next bar. And of course, it starts on the third beat of the bar, what we call an anacrusic start. So we've got that lift at the beginning. You've got to indicate that to the listener, haven't you? We've got to feel it going, Three, one, you can feel that. Three, one. If it goes three, one, well, that first note sounds like it's the first beat of the bar because we've given it a clout and we're feeling clonk. Well, that must be the first beat. Well, actually, it isn't the first beat. When you have an anacrusis like that, I think one very useful thing is to think can I count the two beats that are sort of missing? before it. So you kind of feel your way into the anacrusis. One, two, three, one. Much more likely to enable you to do that. So you may not have to do that in the end, but as a way of practicing delivering the anacrusis so it works, that's quite a useful way of thinking about it. OK, so that's quite a bit about kind of the emphasis. Now, how do, how do we want that to play out then? Well, how about something like this? So as you see, I'm, I'm leaning on those first beats of the bar, but hopefully making it reasonably subtle. So I'm not hearing thump on the first beat of the bar, but I'm feeling the progression of the music from one bar to the next, rather than sitting down on each beat. And so we're feeling it going from one beat to the next. So that's kind of dealing with kind of rhythm, meter, emphasis issues in relation to allowing this melody to sing out. Now, I think one other interesting feature in the design of this melody, particularly about the rhythm, is the way that Schubert has these dotted notes on the second beats of the bars. It happens there, it happens there, it's back here, it's back here. So in fact, you can see it's not just a sort of one-off. It's quite a feature, isn't it? Now, if you put a dotted rhythm, uh, like a dotted crotchet, a dotted quarter note, 
Normally that comes on the first beat of a bar or a measure when you're in triple time. Because in a way, the dotted crotchet, the dotted quarter note, slightly draws attention to itself. So if you put it on the second beat of the bar, well, actually that's designed to slightly draw attention to it. So now you're probably thinking, well, hang on a minute, you were saying a moment ago, we need to kind of make something of the first beats of the bar, but then we've got these dotted crotchets, these dotted quarter notes on the second beat of the bar. So some people might over exaggerate that feature by making too much of the second beats like this. Now you can see that's not really working, but there is a sense in which Schubert is just kind of nudging the natural emphasis by putting those dotted notes. So we've got to kind of think from one bar to the next in the way that we've talked about, but also very subtly recognize that very slight push on the second beats when you get the dotted notes. There's a way of kind of making that work, isn't there? So these are all things that you might want to play around with. What I'm not trying to do here is to say, this is the right way to play the piece. What I'm trying to do is flag up issues that you can think about in your own interpretation and you'll be able to apply them to other pieces as well. Now, I don't want to get over analytical. On the other hand, it's quite useful to kind of realize, well, what's going on here? This page is the first section of the uh, whole impromptu. Uh, so you've got, you've got this page and then there's another page that's a, that's a trio that goes on a bit further. And then we eventually come back and we do this first section again. So there's a kind of overall ternary structure, A, B, A. So we're just looking at the A section here. And you can see this A section divides into sort of two halves, but they're not equal halves. So we've got this, the first two lines repeated, and then we've got the second half of this section repeated. So I say it's not equal halves because when we get to this point, we are returning to this opening material again. So even within this first A section, there's a kind of A, B, A structure to it, which looks like a sort of ternary structure inside the overall ternary form. It's not really that because of the repeats. Uh, so this is really, this section is in two sections with the second longer than the first. So that's a binary structure for the A section of the overall ternary form. But because we've got a reprise of the opening A thing, it's what we call a rounded binary form or an extended binary form. It's just worth knowing things like that. Okay, so when you come to this section, you're thinking, oh yeah, it is a rerun of the opening. I'm sure everybody would notice that. But then it's also kind of thinking, well, what's different? Because there are differences the second time. Okay, how do I draw out those differences? These are all questions for you to think about. So we've got these two sections and we've talked about the overall structure. So we've got the first section going down there. We've got the second section ending there. But in this middle section, we go to that point before we start on a reprise, modified reprise of the opening. Inside that, we've got a phrase structure. So here's the first phrase, it goes through to there. And then we've got, a second phrase that takes us through to there. And then the next phrase through um, to there, and then the last phrase of that section through to there. So you can see what you've got, four phrases. Now I find that often people can do lots of expressive things, but they're not so brilliant at conveying the phrase structure. So if you think of phrases as musical sentences, you know, when we speak to the world or when we write things, we're thinking about sentence structure and sentences, aren't we? So how do we deliver this in phrases? Well, first of all, breathe at the end of a phrase. So we're not just playing straight through the ends of phrases without a breath. So that's an important thing. But then we might think about, what well, how do we inject a bit of shape into each phrase so we can kind of feel the shape of the sentence. When you look at the melody of this opening phrase, it doesn't actually use that many notes, does it? You know, most of the notes were kind of, were sort of part into this corner, A flat, B flat, C, there's, there's a G, and then there's that E flat at the beginning, but it's all quite close quarters. Nevertheless, it does have a natural shape, doesn't it? 
sort of peaking at this point maybe and then coming down again. That's not the only way to do it, but it is true that at this point, there is a musical dissonance. This B flat is a seventh above the bass, so it's kind of going seven to six. It's what we call a suspension. It's prepared on the previous chord. It sounded here, it resolves there. So just at that moment, Schubert has built in this little bit of dissonance. You know, C in the bass, B flat, it's a kind of clash, isn't it? But if you get the context of that, kind of resolving to this. You can feel the tension resolving. So we need to think about things harmonic as well, don't we? So that we're thinking, oh, can I feel where the peak of the phrase is? Is the harmony supporting that? Well, what's the rest of the harmony? We start with a tonic chord called one in A flat major for the whole of the first bar, the first measure. So that's establishing the key. It's a kind of place of you know, neutrality and the musical tension is quite calm. We then go on slight dissonance here. That A flat is a slight clash with the chord. It's what we call an accented passing note or an accented passing tone. And it goes on to this chord, which is a dominant seventh in its second inversion. So we've a bit of movement in the harmony with that dissonance on the first beat. These dissonances on the first beat are helping us to lean on these first beats. And then we've got another dissonance that I've just talked about, that 7-6 dissonance. And then we've got a perfect cadence, dominant seventh to the tonic chord. So the phrase starts on the tonic chord, it ends on the tonic chord. We've got after the first tonic chord, the dominant seventh before the last tonic chord, the dominant seventh. So you see how they're kind of bookending the phrase. And all that helps us to think, ah, there's how we're dealing with the rhythm and the meter. This is what's happening in the harmony. This is where the dissonance is. That all helps us to kind of inject all that into our interpretation. You can think of many other ways of playing it. I'm trying to uh, observe Schubert's markings, you know, allegretto, not too fast. I mean, you can take a view on the tempo. Uh, sempre legato, I'm trying to get that line to be fairly well connected, but also just to generate those little bits of phrasing. I'm trying to balance the texture with weight on the top. I'm trying to respect these first beats in the triple meter. I'm also trying to respect those little pushes on the second beat. I'm trying to hear those dissonances and paint the harmony build the shape of the phrase to that B flat at the beginning of the third bar, let it melt into the end of the phrase. So I'm not saying that's how you have to play it. I'm saying those are things that will influence the way in which you choose to play it. Okay, so we've had the first phrase. And then we have a second phrase, which kind of balances that first phrase. Okay, well, you can hear how that's kind of, if you like, a question and an answering phrase. Same things going on in the second phrase, so many of the same issues that we've just talked about. What do we notice though? The second phrase, the melody has gone up. It's higher than it was in the first phrase. So that's just elevated the kind of tension a little bit. The texture is a bit thicker you know, more notes. Do you notice how the melody in the right hand is being doubled at the lower octave? So we've got just single melody in the first phrase, but in the second phrase, it's in octaves. And that's the thing that's really thickening our texture, isn't it? So there's a slight difference, a slight building of what's going on. Much of the harmony is the same, but we're still thinking about enhancing our dissonance. And you notice little things like, when we had the 5-7 chord there, it was in second inversion. When we have the 5-7 chord again here, it's in third inversion. So the first time it was this, this time it's... So it's kind of slightly elevated the tension. So you can just feel there's a kind of emotional temperature about the first phrase. The second phrase has just elevated that a bit. 
it's not particularly louder. It's still under that PP umbrella. But I don't think you can really play the second phrase quite you know, exactly the same as the first phrase because there is that slight rise in emotional temperature. Okay, there's a little bit of a hairpin that you can kind of make something of there, which is all good. But you can hear that we've got much of the same harmonic plan, much of the same kind of melodic idea, but all sorts of things elevated. The higher pitch, the thicker texture, the doubling of the melody in octaves, the use of that different inversion of the dominant seventh. All of this is just adding a little bit of emotional heat to it. Okay, so then we get the third phrase. Now, what's the third phrase? Well, we've just gone back to the first phrase and repeated it again, haven't we? So is there anything different about that? Well, there is, because the right hand has now gone up an octave. The first phrase was down here, kind of in the middle of the piano, hands reasonably close together. Now the right hand's an octave higher and the hands are much more widely spaced. So we can feel a bit more kind of air in the middle of the texture and a slightly brighter sound at the top. It's a different impact, isn't it? To have it up there. So you're thinking about the same issues, but you're just enjoying that slightly different texture, the space in the middle of it, the slightly brighter, higher sound. You know, if you were orchestrating this, you know, you, you might have this opening melody on the on the violins or a clarinet or something, but probably here you'd be orchestrating for the flute. So it's kind of always good to think, actually, what kind of colours are we looking for? Some people think literally in colours. They say, oh, that's a pink moment or a blue moment. That doesn't particularly work for me, but if it works for you, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, but certainly brighter sounds, darker sounds, more spaced out sounds, you know, all these things are happening. So you can see how that's impacting. Okay, well, this was the same as the first phrase, but placed up an octave. So then we think, oh yeah, I know what's going to happen now. This is going to be the same as the second phrase, up an octave. Yeah, it sort of starts like that, doesn't it? You know, um, this this stuff as well is the sort of same as that, isn't it? But do you notice then what happens that Schubert changes the harmony? So in this little moment, he uses the secondary dominant into F minor. It goes chord five, makes it five, seven in F minor, has a little dissonant passing note, passing tone onto F minor. So there's the tonic chord of F minor. F minor is the relative minor of A flat major, so it's a closely related key. The tonic chord of F minor is called six in A flat major, so it's just a temporary five one in another key, secondary dominant, and the one in the other key is a chord in the prevailing key. So the one in F minor is chord six in A flat major. So you see the impact of that. The second phrase, the one that started here, went like this. But this time, this phrase goes like this. So up an octave and a different harmony. And then he puts this turn to get to the cadence. And notice there's a lovely touch at the cadence as well, apart from that turn, which I think is gorgeous. You get this five, seven to one thing that's going on. But in fact, is it five, seven? Because he's put this C at the top, which actually makes it five, 13. So he's further extended the chord. So we kind of got to do something to kind of stretch that. So I'm hoping what this is demonstrating is kind of like, well, what are the issues that we need to think about? We need to think about, well, what's happening melodically? Where is the melodic line? Do I need to solo that out? How do I need to shape it? How does the melody sit with all these other things? What are the characteristics of rhythm and metre? And what impact does that have? What's the harmony doing? Uh, where are the tensions in the harmony? Where are the dissonances and the consonances? If things are repeated, are they repeated the same way? Are they varied? How are they varied? What does that mean for my interpretation? Texture, you know, how is the sound organised? So we've seen this going up the octave, changing the impact of things. Uh, what's the structure? Knowing what the overall structure of the piece is, knowing what the phrase structure is and how one phrase belongs to another. So we present the whole of this first section as a cohesive whole where we've got these four phrases 
uh, where we've got a first phrase answered by a second phrase, the first phrase coming back, and then the, the second phrase coming back, but, you know, reasonably substantially modified. And then he suddenly bursts out of all of this and has something totally different. So we've got to be ready for this. It's almost like this first section is all very reserved because the big guns are on their way. So as soon as you get down to the 16th bar, the 16th measure, forte. And we've got these big kind of solid chords going on now. It's not the kind of elegant stuff that we were hearing before. It's more powerful, dramatic. <laughs> Staccato, and then fortissimo. And then dramatic staccato and dramatic harmony as well. And then an FF set. And then it all melts away. So you think that's the end of it. And then fortissimo again. And then a little, a little turn and then it all melts away with a chromatic chord and then we let it all die away to the end of this. Pause because expectation building. What's coming next? Ah, it's a return to our old familiar friend from the beginning of the piece. So you see how the central drama of this thing is such a contrast with the outer sections. Well, we could talk through all this stuff. I mean, there's all this thick, chord stuff going on here, more powerful left hand probably as well. You've got your accents, you've got articulation to think about there. Don't be too loud there because you need to keep something in reserve there. Again, watch out for these accents. The harmony there is all kind of reasonably straightforward. This is all chord one, and then we've got chord six, chord five, seven, chord one, back to chord four that goes on for quite a long time, so quite a slow harmonic rhythm. Then we have this little moment, which is quite interesting, where you get this B double flat thing going on. So it's kind of like, oh yeah, so what's going on there? We're kind of sort of doing something a bit unexpected, aren't we, with that? So you might think it's going to go from there to here to there to there. So you think this is going to be a D flat major followed by a G flat major, but actually it's, it's kind of G flat minor, isn't it? So borrowing a chord from the parallel key. Okay, so we're in A flat major and we're kind of borrowing A flat minor. You see what all that's about. So borrowing from the parallel key. Or you might think actually this is really more about D flat major borrowing from D flat minor, but it's certainly adding drama. If it was a major chord, that's what we'd expect. Then it goes minor, borrowed chord. So that's an added drama. And then we go back to it again. He's not giving up on that. And then it gets even more chromatic there. And then we're doing this. Again, D flat minor chord rather than D flat major chord and then the turn, and then he uses something called a German six. Ooh, lovely bit of colour that as he melts away into the piano. And then we go on to a chord one in second inversion. That's going to resolve to a chord five, seven. And the chord five, seven is dying to go back to chord one, which eventually happens. So you see how that central drama plays out. Well, there's a heck of a lot more we could say about that, but I hope that gives you a kind of start on how you might think about interpreting this particular piece, but ideas for interpretation in general, just by thinking through kind of what's actually going on, what Schubert written here, what might that mean for the way we play it? And as I say, there is not a kind of one size fits all. Any interpretation is valid, as long as it respects what the composer has written. So if you decide that actually you're going to make a big deal of the bass line in this, well, it's going to raise questions about why you're doing that, because the melody's at the top. You know, if you're going to play it in such a way where every single beat has got equal weight on it, we're not really respecting the triple meter, we're not enabling the line to sing. So there's good reasoning behind all of our thinking. Why are we making a big deal of certain moments? because there's dissonance, or there's chromatic harmony, borrowed chords, whatever, or because the texture's thicker, or because the dynamic's stronger. You might use a bit of rubato to paint certain corners, draw out the dissonance, take a little bit of time at the end of the phrase to breathe. 
you know, all sorts of aspects of interpretation will come about, but try to do that through some kind of reasoned approach. So I hope that's a kind of helpful set of insights into interpretation in general and interpretation of this piece in particular. Well, if you found this video helpful, let me invite you to the Music Matters website, www.mmcourses.co.uk. And if you click on courses on the homepage, you'll see we've got a vast array of courses there. One in particular you might want to have a look at is our Beethoven analysis course. Beethoven, of course, a contemporary of Schubert, we've just been thinking about. And we've got a, a complete exploration of Beethoven's Pathetic Piano Sonata there. Kind of going into some of this analytical detail uh, and really thinking through what's actually going on in the piece that, again, would help you think through an interpretation of that piece. Many other things on the website, so have a good search around and see what's of interest to you. www.mmcourses.co.uk